So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I'm so excited to do tonight's meeting because we'll be presenting some certificates and awards to some students who have just been amazing this entire school year, the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council. So it will be a fun meeting. Um, and then, uh, and we have some other stuff here too, obviously. So um, we will call the roll. Alderwoman McAndrew. Here. Alderwoman Buse. Here. Alderwoman Patel. Here. Alderman Fader. Here. Alderman Hummel. Here. Alderman York. Here. Mayor Harris. Here. City Manager Gibson. Here. City Attorney O'Keefe. Here. Thank you. Good. Now's the time in our agenda when we uh, ask for public requests or petitions. If somebody has something they want to cover with us, a uh, comment or question that is not on tonight's agenda, now is your chance. If you come up, make sure the microphone is on and state your name and your address. Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> I'm Um, the reason I think it's important tonight is I'm not certain where you are in this process. I have heard the outline. I know we're supposed to meet with WashU if WashU creates those meetings, but it's almost summer. So what I would like to say is that at our Hillcrest meeting, it was indicated that the Board of Aldermen is fully in support of the proposed rezoning with the overlay district. That was news to me. I'm not sure where that stands. Um, my objection tonight is really the idea of the overlay district instead of the conditional use permit process that we have used historically. And I feel that it um, we are headed towards doing this rezoning um, without fully considering the ways in which this might go wrong for us. Um, I made a few brief notes. I didn't have time to write you um, a letter and I apologize for that. That deluge hit my house. Um, with the addition of Fontbon into the mix, I feel strongly that this is too soon to be giving a green light to Washington U's pro U University's proposal to move their athletic fields to the Big Bend overlay. Um, there's going to be a lot of time to consider how font bond can be divvied up in the future, and WashU is not even ready to talk about that. So this is a little alarming to me because I'm surrounded on both sides. Um, currently, and I want to say too, I have nothing against WashU. I am only in Clayton, Missouri because my husband was recruited to WashU, and he's still going strong. So this is not in opposition to Washington University, or for that matter, font bond or Concordia, who have all been great neighbors. They've even taken the time to protect our tree canopy. Currently, however, the neighbors are usually not bothered by the events on the fields, and our neighborhoods have been developed over decades. The sudden imposition of the noise levels, the lights, and the traffic that have been described to this relatively small parcel cannot be consistent, in my view, with maintaining what's indicated by a residential nature of the area. Um, in a sense, we're there first, and I believe in development in the community from the bottom up, not the top down. Um, our urban planners will probably know that I'm stealing from Jane Jacobs in that, but I hark from Greenwich Village, so that's my right. I believe it is up to Wash U to develop their plans more fully and make their proposals to you more fully in order for you to evaluate. It should not be falling upon Clayton taxpayers to spend our resources, and I would include your time for a year so far, trying to figure out what the effects of these changes might be. I really do not think this is the time for us to be giving up the use of the conditional use permitting. There might come a time when it seems more reasonable, but I am alarmed because I don't know when you might be voting on that. I don't know if I'll be out of town visiting my grandchildren back on the East Coast, and I wanted to get a word in tonight. 
So thank you for what you have done. I think it was done in the right spirit. I really appreciate how open you've been with the neighborhood. And it has given us an opportunity we might not have had to see what in the world um, WashU is planning to bring to us. So that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, just one clarification for you. I, I want to make sure you, it's understood that I think the remark was made at the meeting. The Board of Aldermen supports pursuing the investigation of the overlay, not necessarily everything that was listed in it that night. And I, I know there'll be some changes coming based on all of the uh, comments that came in from the community. Yeah. So just to clarify. All right. <laughs> Yes, there will be. Yeah, but not yet. Okay, um, great. So now is time for the fun stuff. Um, students, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm going to try to do it this way. I know you each have a very brief little report about your work with your committee. And so I'm going to come around here and I'm going to have the certificates that I will give you. I'm going to call you up by name you can give your report and I'll give you your certificate. How's that sound? All right, that's what I'm gonna try to do. So just for those who may not be aware, um, the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council uh, goes through the whole year of learning about the city of Clayton and kind of one of the one of the goals of this is to have uh, students students learn what local government is all about and maybe be inspired to participate in their own local community someday and this has been a really really great group I just want to say at the outset I'm so proud of all you guys um, so with that being said let me try to juggle all of these all these things, the microphone and the certificates. So I'm just gonna start start off the top um, in the order that these were given to me, no particular order. Gavin Wickenhauser, would you come up and give your report? <coughs> and they could use this microphone, right? Yes, yeah, so turn this on. And there you go, and I'll step over here. All right. Good evening to the Board of Aldermen and everyone else gathered here at the Clayton City Hall. My name is Gavin Wickenhauser, and I'm a junior from John Burroughs High School. Over the course of this year, I have been closely following the Plan and Architectural Review Board as they've orchestrated structural developments within our city. To be honest, I was a little confused coming out of my first meeting, and I didn't understand a lot of the formal processes through which items presented to the board would be reviewed accepted or potentially critiqued. As time went on though, I realized that the board, along with all of its members, have their processes down to an exact method. Regardless of what kind of project is being assessed, whether that be a complete reconstruction of a building, such as the 726 and 734 DeMond Avenue, or something as simple as a new storefront sign on 8125 Forsyth Boulevard, the same steps are always followed. One of the more interesting ideas, which I've taken away from both the plan and architectural review board has been the use of precedent to make decisions about current projects. In other words, committee members will often reflect back on they made previous decisions to inform approval for new ones. This just speaks to the complexity of the role for all seven members must have a solid understanding of both the key principles of architecture, but also the history of the many neighborhoods and buildings which make up the city. As I've already mentioned, the Plan ARB Board is such an efficient way to manage the countless projects occurring throughout Clayton. That is why I found it hard to come up with a recommendation or another way to further improve the system. But then I thought back to my own experiences as a mayor's um, youth advisory council member and the discussions that we had about community engagement. There were many times when I came home to debrief my parents on the various plans which were discussed that day only to hear that they had not heard about it. Therefore, 
My suggestion is to increase public awareness of these project of these projects going through the plan and architectural review board. Um, I believe this would not only increase awareness of Clayton's residents, but it would also increase the turnout at meetings, allowing for a greater diversity of perspectives going into decision making. Before I conclude, I would like to thank all of those who have made the MYAC possible. Ms. Ablees, Ms. Kearley, Mayor Harris, um, my fellow members of the council. Um, and in addition, I would like to thank Mr. Steve Lichtenfeld, the chairman of Plan ARB, um, who's been so kind and helpful throughout all of the meetings. Finally, to the Board of Aldermen, thank you for your support of the program and your time here today. Thank you. You are well. Okay, next, Lavanya Hi, so as you heard, I'm Lavanya Mani, and I'm a junior at Clayton High School. So let me see if I can actually pull up what I wrote for this. Um, so for this year, I've been following the plans of the Livable Community Committee, keeping up with a lot of their email correspondences, as well as their Zoom meetings and when they spoke to the Sustainability and Equity Committees. So my main impression, there have been two really big takeaways I've had. First of all, I was kind of amazed by how present they were. Like, if I couldn't attend one of their meetings, I went to an equity commission meeting and they were there presenting to the equity commission. And then I went to a sustainability committee meeting and they were there too. And I was amazed by how much of an involvement this committee has in all the aspects of Clayton, making it a better place. And my other biggest impression was that this community, this committee has been so focused on making Clayton more people centric, making it more walkable, more friendly to nature and to like people living in nature. And I think that the main goal has been and should continue to be making Clayton more than just a business district into a place where it is like a home where people enjoy themselves in their leisure time. So I have two main recommendations to the committee. My first recommendation is a little simpler, which is just have more meetings outside of school hours, because one of my biggest problems attending the meetings is they all happen to be Zoom meetings while I was in class, which if we're trying to encourage more young people to be involved, and I definitely think we should, we have to make it so they can actually attend the Zoom calls. And the other thing, which is a little more broad, was that the main goal of this committee moving forward should be making Clayton a more fun place to be in in our free time. I mean, Clayton is already a thriving business area in, when we look at the greater St. Louis area. But beyond our nine to fives, when we're at out and about, when we're just enjoying ourselves, I think the biggest goal of the Livable Community Committee should be to encourage more events like the art fair, like the open streets events, to make sure that people are enjoying themselves because that's when I think the beauty of a community is the most beneficial to those that are there. So before I finish this, I want to thank everyone who has made this possible, specifically Matt Malik, who in the um, Livable Community com Livable Community Committee has been in charge on a lot of the correspondences. I want to thank Mayor Harris for obviously being a huge part of all of this. Um, Miss Ablees and Miss Kearley for really organizing this, especially as a Clayton student, be, as them two being there, and to all of you as the Board of Aldermen for you know he hearing us, being here, and for all you do for our community. So thank you. Okay, next we'll want to have Audrey Aranha. Hi, my name is Audrey Arana, and I'm a senior in Clayton High School. I will be attending St. Louis University this fall and will be majoring in biochemistry. I followed the Parks and Recreation Department over the course of the year, and I learned about the amount of time and work the committee members spent accomplishing everything on their agenda. 
Like every time I attended a meeting, they began with like discussing everything they did on their old agenda before they started like talking about the things that need they need to accomplish. And I learned that they plan all the co community events taking place in Clayton and they make sure everything is perfect from the beginning to the end. And attending these meetings also helped me learn about like the projects taking place in Clayton because living in Clayton for so many years, sometimes I'm not aware of what's happening, but attending this meeting helped me learn that there is a Remembrance Park being built next to the St. Louis Med County Library. And there were also renovations for the splash pads in the shop park and the tennis courts. Um, one of my recommendation is one of the parks and recreation committee members suggest, suggested an orchard near Anderson Park. And I thought it's really interesting, like people coming to like grow and plant fruits and people could later eat it. It's also fun like when families come with their kids and like the parents can like walk their dogs while the children are growing and like learning to plant fruits. It, and I feel like there should also be signs to explain the different types of fruits being planted. So it's also like an educational opportunity while the kids are enjoying in the orchard. Um, and another one of my suggestion is like rental bikes in shop park because I feel like it snows do like most of the months. So during the summer, people can have like rental bikes to bike in the shop park while also walking. And finally, I'd like to thank Mayor Harris, the Board of Aldermen and Ms. Abelis and Ms. Curley for giving me an opportunity to be part of my act. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Henry Rosenblum and I'm a junior at Clayton High School. The committee I followed this year was the Mayor's Landscape Committee. And the biggest impression I got was I didn't realize how many factors went into play when um, considering adding different plaques or memorials to Clayton, such as um, the the placement of the plaque or the ideas of who it's dedicated to. And one recommendation I have for the city of Clayton is I think that we should add more outdoor basketball courts because I feel that we have a lot of um, other, other like areas for sports, but I don't think we have many places for basketball. So I think it would be beneficial to the community, to the community, excuse me. And thank you to everyone who's made this possible this year. Mayor Harris, Ms. Kearley, the Board of Aldermen, and Ms. Abelis, thank you so much. Give me one moment. Um, hi, my name is Shiv Patel, and I'm a junior at Clayton High School, and this year I followed the Board of Aldermen Committee. So one key takeaway, um, the biggest of which I learned this year was a city's tending to its historic um, landmarks. So prior to being a part of MIAC, I had no idea about how cities uh, are able to preserve the parts of Clayton that make Clayton Clayton. I always thought that cities are always trying to modernize everything they can and move into the future in every aspect. But over the course of these meetings, I was able to learn about how, for example, there was um, a building where we had to redo the roof and you had to go through different options as to what you were going to change the shingles to and go through different factors and see what was best for the city. But in the end, we ended up choosing the option that was preserving the historic um as material on the roofing. And even something as small as that shows me that Clayton is able to always focus on what 
parts of Clayton have always been there so that we don't lose our roots. So that was something that stuck with me. Um, as far as the proposal that I want to make for the city, I, I sat down to think about it a minute and I, I wanted to approach it by first going way back to when I got to Clayton. So I want to tell a brief story about the fact that I moved to Clayton when I was four years old. And one way that my family got to know people is by going to block parties at Clayshire Park in Clayshire. That's where I've lived for the last 10 years. And so that was somewhere where my family and I got to know people, the first people that we met in Clayton. Something that stuck out to me was the fact that now, 10 years later, I had actually just come from um, pitching to the Board of Education on behalf of the Clayton Catalyst Program. And one of the parents there was speaking to me, she does real estate about parents in our neighborhood and families in our neighborhood. And she said, do you know so-and-so? I said, no. Do you know so-and-so? I said, no. And it made me realize that in 10 years, I no longer know any of these families in my neighborhood. So it got me to thinking about the um, idea of community in Clayton and how we're going to be stronger moving forward. A friend of mine lives on Kingsbury and growing up, he knew everyone in his neighborhood and they've all been super close friends. For me, it made me think about the fact that we need to be able to promote um, a sense of community in our smaller neighborhoods to be able to promote a greater sense of community as a city. So, I mean, even one example I was thinking about is, you know, me who came to this um, city when I was four years old, that's the first chance that you get to make friends in a new city. So if I had moved into Kingsbury, maybe I would have had lifelong friends that I made there. And in turn, that makes us stronger as a city. So really my proposition is for the city of Clayton to be able to help in hosting events, um, maybe in parks near neighborhoods where kids and families are able to get to know each other. Because my question is, how are we gonna be able to grow stronger as a city if we first don't grow stronger in our connections with one another. So please um, hopefully adopt or entertain this idea and feel free to speak with me if you think we should move further with it. Thank you. Um. Um, hi, my name is Bridget Gustafson, and I'm a junior at Clayton. And the committee that I followed over the course of this year was the Sustainable Action Committee or Sustainability Committee. Um, and what I found most interesting um, was how many like aspects of Clayton they work with um, because sometimes there, we would spend like a whole meeting they would be talking about like the benchmarking plan for buildings and business um, which is more like downtown Clayton and the business stuff but then also they would talk about like the open streets thing and interacting with the public more and like no mo april and all these like initiatives for native plants or more things that people do like individually and then also with the city itself like electrification um the fleet electric electrification and stuff with like the city so i thought it was interesting how they cross over between the people the business the city and government and yeah that was um pretty interesting to me and also we um the three of us um, were in the sustainability committee and um, specifically uh, Deb Grossman, Deborah Grossman, who um, leads that committee. She really made us get involved. And I, that was great to actually be able to work on a project. And she always asked us if we had questions to what they were talking about or anything like that. So I really liked how we got really involved and we weren't just like sitting there listening um, and then my main idea, well, this is more specific to the sustainability, um, because there's a lot of stuff with like the new uh, livable communities plan and like what the 20, 40, however many years plan for Clayton. And I think a big thing that could be implemented, I'm not sure how difficult this is, so I'm just saying it, um, like electric leaf blowers instead of or leaf blowers, because 
big thing like you know Saturday morning eight o'clock and you're like oh they're already going with the leaf blowers and there's a lot of stuff um not just with like um gas versus electric like the pollution that it makes but also the noise pollution um is a big thing and there's like a lot of research and stuff how that is actually harmful too along with obviously gas power is bad um so that was just I don't really know what goes into that like an ordinance or something but I think that doesn't like it seems like a small step that would um, be really beneficial and yeah uh that was my suggestion and then obviously I just want to thank all of you guys the board of aldermen alderwomen and uh, Mayor Harris, of course, being on the MIAC was super interesting. And Ms. Keeley and Ms. Abelis, whoever you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you, guys. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Adelaide Pollack. I'm a junior at Clayton High School this year, and I attended the Sustainability Advisory Committee meetings. Um, and my biggest impression is that I was just really surprised at how much policy sustainability involves in Clayton. Um, I, I was aware that in order to have a greener Clayton, um, different policies and rules and research had to go through multiple layers of people, but I wasn't really aware of like how much time they spend solely just getting different rules enacted and different things pushed to different people. Um, and I found that Ms. Grossman um, truly spent like a lot of time uh, communicating to different people um, and pushing out different stuff to different people because nothing can get put in place without going through like the proper review um, and approval processes. So I thought that that was really interesting because it kind of adds kind of a whole nother layer to just being sustainable, but you also have to have something to get it all happen. Um, and I was also uh, really surprised with just like the level of detail that sustainability takes because when you think about a city, you just don't really think about like the small things that go into what they're talking about at these meetings. Like, for example, they're talking about what materials we're making new roofs with, what um, salt we're icing the roads with when it's snowy, um, different like fleet electrification vehicles. Um, it's all that type of stuff that, you know, the average person doesn't really think about. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. Um, and I wasn't really aware at first before all of this happened, um, at like the work that Clayton puts into building a more sustainable city. I wasn't aware of the different processes, the different things that were in place for this to happen. So I think like my top recommendation, um, is just more like getting the word out there about the different research and events and measures people can take to help with the cause and also just become more educated themselves, um, right now, the Sustainability Advisory Committee does have a website that they've utilized and they put a lot of stuff up, um, but I don't think many people know about that resource. Um, and I, so I think not only building that, but also maybe another form of marketing that kind of targets maybe the youth, because that's kind of the future of Clayton, would really be helpful um, to help educate everybody on building a greener city um, and just kind of move the city towards the goals that it's striving towards. Um, so I want to thank the Board of Aldermen, obviously, Ms. Abelis, Ms. Keeley, and Mayor Harris for making this all possible. Thank you. So uh, hello, my name is Kayla Park and I am a junior at Clayton High School. For this year, uh, the committee that uh, I decided to attend the meeting of, the meetings of sort of uh, is the Clayton Community Foundation. Now they aren't really in a, an integrated government committee compared to say uh, parks and recreation, but uh, nevertheless, they were extremely fascinating and uh, besides, they work a lot with uh, the city of Clayton. So uh, my first impression of them 
uh, was the fact that, well, for starters, they were this, they are this uh, nonprofit organization and they deal a lot with donors and they deal a lot with the community. So in meetings, there's always uh, conversations about word of mouth and spreading information about all of these projects that uh, need funding. And uh, it's this open dialogue that I found really fascinating and was really captivating to me. And uh, something that I would see in these meetings is the fact that for many of the people that would attend them, they would usually be people who aren't really doing anything for the Clayton Community Foundation, but nevertheless, they always just provide their input. And it's with that, that I think is, it's just absolutely great for uh, not only this organization, to be able to have open dialogue with much of the community, but also just for city government. Um, and the Clayton Community Foundation, they focus a lot on culture and livability. So usually they pour their funding from donors to things like historical site markers. I know recently for homes that were constructed about a century ago, they're now trying to push for plaques for those. They've gotten artwork loaned from the St. Louis Art Museum. And it's all of this that, uh, that I could see that they're really invested in uh, making place. And it's with this that uh, I would like to talk about any recommendations I have for the Clayton Community Foundation. I can't really think of any because I think what they've done in terms of dialogue and in terms of really working with the community is I think excellent. All I would say is probably to really invest in, I guess, communication because unless you're caught up in word of mouth discussions or you happen to come across any of the projects that they've poured funding into, uh, someone, a resident of Clayton may not really understand the impact that the Clayton Community Foundation really has in the local area. And it's with this that uh, before I leave, uh, I would like to thank for stars the Board of Aldermen for listening to us and for all of the hard work they uh, really pour out for this community, Mayor Harris, Ms. Abelis, and uh, Ms. Kearley for, of course, making the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council a thing. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Riley Zimmerman. Um, I'm a junior at Clayton High School, and I am on the mayor's, sorry, mayor's commemorative landscape committee. Um, I thought that everyone on this committee was really great, and they really voiced their opinions really well. Um, I understood what everyone wanted with this, especially since it's so important to hear their voices in these. One thing I found really impressive through this, though, was that everyone would reach out to, for example, Mayor Harris, she reached out to the Osage tribe and got their voice involved within the plaque that they were making, which I thought was like really impactful because I would personally not think to reach out to them, even though I know it's like a commemoration for them. I just, I would research about it and, you know, put my like heart into it, but I would never like be like, hey, what do you think? And I think it's really powerful that she reached out to them and um, got their perspectives on it and asked, you know, what do you want to see? What is your voice? What do you want to do with this? And I thought that was really cool, along with the Philippine tribe. Um, yeah. And there was so much effort involved in everything, along with the um, photo of Mayor Clayton. He just got taken down from the city, the, um, sorry. Yeah, you just got taken out right there and um, figuring out where to put it has, I never thought about how much effort it's taken into figuring out where to put this picture because 
I, I don't know, I've never thought about a photo that's just been hanging up here. And I thought that was really cool just to kind of see a different perspective within the community. Um, along with this, because coming into this, I didn't really know what this committee was. And since it's about commemorating these different communities within the clay and community, um, I think that having a social media presence would be much better for this committee because um, you know, someone like me, I don't really know what's going on as like just through being a teenager. I'm not, I don't hear as much from the adults and stuff. And I'm, I'm not really reading all the plaques around this place. So I think being on social media would be great just to let the younger kids of Clayton know what is going on and really help them understand their community and different parts of the community that used to live here and really help them understand the history of what was you know, what used to be here. Um, so I think you know, being on Instagram or maybe even TikTok, I don't know, that might be a bit stretch, but like, I think something like that would be really cool and just better for everyone in play and to know all the hard work that you guys put into it. Um, lastly, I want to thank Miss Avalies, Mayor Harris, and Miss Keeley for allowing me to be a part of this. You know, it's um, really been cool to learn about local government, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have um, Miss Avalies send out my. Instagram handle to all you guys, because I actually do post very infrequently, but I do. Hello, my name is Liam Ferguson, and I am a senior at Clayton High School, and I will be attending San Diego State University in the fall. So my committee this year was the Board of Aldermen. And I think my first impression was how I was going to deal with this whole school year, not knowing what you guys were talking about with this complex vocabulary. And as the meetings progressed, I learned and learned more. And as I was able to understand these like complex processes that you guys underwent, whether it was traffic laws or someone trying to build a house too big, all of them had a same lengthy process. So that surprised me. And moving forward, as a senior who graduates next week, my biggest thing that I wish that I had throughout my entire academic career was likely a mentor who was there to guide me through different things. So what I would think something that would be beneficial to implement would be a mentorship group, whether it's held at the library, at the center, where students of any age can meet with adults or other students who are able to guide them through school assignments or college applications or even job resumes. So as someone who's done it, that's my suggestion as if I could do it again. And finally, I'd like to give a great thanks to the Board of Aldermen for having me this year. I really learned a lot. I'd like to thank Mayor Harris as well, Ms. Abelese and Ms. Keeley. So thank you guys for your time. Hi, my name is Stella Whitney, and I'm a senior at Clayton High School this year. Um, I plan to attend University of Illinois next year and major in financial planning. Um, this was my first year in MIAC and with any type of knowledge of like government at all, besides like the class you take at school. And I was a little nervous initially coming in because I didn't know what to do. Um, but I ended up following the Clayton Sports Rec and Wellness um, committee with Bridget McAndrew and I thought it was really interesting especially because I was able to connect a lot with the things they were talking about and like make connections with my life at growing up and even today. Um, one of the things I found to be most interesting during my time was the amount of data and like specific things they had to know like all of those aspects that go into the decision making and um, yeah, basically just how they used all the data they collected to make decisions on the spot um, about how to like delegate funds and deal with advertising and whatnot, um, just do what's best for the community. I thought that was really interesting. Um, one suggestion I would have for the committee is this past 
uh, meeting last Friday, we spent a lot of time talking about how we can get back to what we had like previous, like pre COVID. And I would just like to just kind of throw out there that I think just focusing on like the future and like the goals for the future, rather than trying to get back what you had, like is more important in my opinion. And I would just like to thank all of the board of aldermen, Mayor Harris, uh, Mrs. Abelis and Ms. Curley for all the time and effort you guys put into making this a really fun and interesting program. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Nesa Jay, and I am a junior at Clayton High School. Um, I follow the Livable Community Group, and I was really impressed by how many strategies are needed to fulfill like one goal. And so the community or the committee had like six goals that were um, from feedback by the community. So like for example, to make things more walkable or bikeable, and so there were there were like eight different plans that needed to be um, finalized to make this happen. And my top recommendation for the livable committee would be to find more ways to involve the community past, like just gathering feedback. And this could be through ways like um, having volunteer opportunities for students to set up these events that they have voted on and um, advocated for and um, also to organize things like drives for people who are in need. And I think that the more people are participating in setting up these events, the more that they'll talk about it with other people in the Clayton community. Um, I would like to say thank you for all the guidance from Ms. Abelis and Ms. Kearley, and a special thank you to Mayor Harris for continuing this um, council because I really had a lot of fun with it, and um, as well as the Board of Aldermen, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Yehe Saeed. I'm a junior at Clayton High School and this past year I followed the Community Equity Commission. So my biggest takeaway from this was I was just incredibly impressed at how well all the members um, stayed closely in touch with what's going on in Clayton and aimed to always like understand their community from the people who are actually in it. They always took the opportunity to send out the next survey to get their next like form of input to always understand what the community members actually need so that they can stay sort of aware of what's needed and ensure that the policies that they're proposing and the things that they're implementing actually go to benefit our community. And so um, I have two major recommendations. The first is to continue to make our communication with our community more inclusive, um, whether that means implementation of more bilingual signs in Clayton, um, especially in terms of like Spanish and Chinese, or just other general messaging ensuring that every member of our community can access that and truly understand their government and understand sort of our community. And second, to keep our housing code updated and equitable to ensure that it stays sort of with the modern times, because oftentimes we talked a lot in this commission about how it can be extremely overbearing for certain families and certain individuals and how sometimes it's a little too restrictive. So making sure that that stays up to date and with the current times is really important. And so lastly, I'd like to say thank you to all the advisors and adults who helped us out this year, the Board of Aldermen, and of course, Mayor Harris, Ms. Kearley, and Ms. Abelis for making this all possible. Hi everyone, my name is Jalen Lin. I'm currently a junior at Clayton High School and I was part of the Parks and Recreational Committee. One very impactful impression that I had was how everyone worked so independently and then each month when we were at our meetings, people, the our committee would have somebody representing each plan and presenting that plan to the rest of the committee. I was really impressed by how organized and professional that was. And then Another impression that I had was they had a plan of expanding the pickleball courts and because people that 
play pickleball were going on to the tennis courts and their plan was to expand the pickleball courts and I was really surprised because personally I would have prioritized tennis but uh, they were really thought out and had a really well thought out idea of instead of regulating and implementing rules they would rather spend money and uh, prioritize the community and the uh, citizens of Clayton's. Then one idea that I had was to install more street lamps in Clayton to make Clayton overall a safer and more bright place. Um, I also had another idea that because uh, our committee works really closely with the center of Clayton about sports and programs and clubs. I was thinking if they wanted to promote their programs, they can work closely with the uh, elementary schools like Glen Ridge, Clayton, Merrimack, or uh, sorry, Glen, Glen Ridge, Captain Merrimack. And I know they send out emails, I think monthly emails to parents. So if they wanted to advocate for their programs, they can definitely work through the elementary schools for that. But other than that, I think the committee is doing a really well job of keeping everything fair, finding the most effective, sustainable, and environmentally friendly solution. And then lastly, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Eric Schneider, who always began our meetings with a positive attitude, funny jokes, and then the rest of the Parks and Rec members, Ms. Abelis for organizing Maya, Mayor Harrison for coping with us, putting us putting up with us lovely high school dudes and then just everyone else for their hard work. Thank you. Um, hello, Board of Aldermen. So my name is Charlie Myers. I'm a junior at Clayton High School, and I spent the duration of this year working on the Sustainability Advisory Committee with uh, Bridget Gustafson and Addie Pollock. And I had a lot of big takeaways from this committee. Um, I've never been directly involved in a sort of government committee or program or service. And so it was really interesting to be able to be immersed into this environment. So I think it's really interesting that, you know, I kind of came into this committee with this preconceived notion that people in sustainability committees talk about, you know, the flowers in their city and like putting solar panels on everything, but it's really not as much of a, you know, blanket job that they have as that. Um, they talk a lot about things that I wouldn't even have thought that you'd talk about, you know, from replacing carpet or like ceiling tiles in buildings. There's these certain um, standards that the city of Clayton sets these businesses and people that utilize their spaces to be able to um, you know, follow certain sustainability, you know, like to be able to have a, a standard, right? And I thought that was really interesting um, because there's this side of sustainability, this business side that no one really thinks about. And so I've become quite enlightened in that aspect. Um, additionally, I will note that the um, logistics side of the advisory committee was really interesting to see. There would be a couple meetings that I'm sure Addie and Bridget can agree with me where there would be a solid 20 minutes that we just did not know what was being said just because there's a lot of, um, you know, refined diction and things that they talk about that are very specific to certain policies, right? They talk about the comprehensive plan, the Clayton tomorrow, livable communities, soul smart, some of these terms that I had never really heard about until joining the committee. And so I think that was a very um, enlightening experience as well. Um, additionally, I will say that I have never seen a group of people with more sheer passion and dedication and devotion to a certain topic um, in my life. I think all of these people have such um, a passion to be able to make Clayton a more sustainable place and to honestly make our society a more sustainable um, community. And I think that it was really powerful, honestly, to see how well these people work together. Even if there were discrepancies or conflicts, people worked really, really well together to be able to ensure that everyone's voices were heard and that the most
conversation and civil discourse being had. Um, in regards to recommendations for the city, I will say, and I know it's easier said than done, that I think um, being able to have more outreach to the youth is pretty important. And I know how hard it is to get people to care about something that you care about and that maybe they don't care about if it's not directly affecting them. But I think being able to increase the outreach towards the youth, I know that throughout this year, um, for context, um, I'm on this my school newspaper, The Globe, at Clayton High School, and I've written multiple articles about climate change. I wrote an article called The Heat is On about climate change and how people in Clayton can do better themselves to be able to better our world. Um, I just wrote an article for the last issue that came out called Turn Your Key, Be Idle Free about the anti-idling campaign that me and the other sustainability um, high school members have worked on throughout the past year on this committee. That's up in the center of Clayton if you guys want to go check it out. And um, I think that you know, that those efforts I've been pretty proud of, but I also don't know if there's going to be someone that's going to do that when I'm graduated next year. And so being able to increase the awareness, especially to high schoolers, whether that be through yard signs in the front of Clayton High School or through social media, like Riley commented earlier, I think it'd be really important just to be able to increase awareness about this. Again, it's easier said than done. Um, in regards to thank yous, I'd like to obviously thank Mayor Harris and Ms. Abelese and Ms. Kearley and the Board of Aldermen, but specifically I'd like to thank Alderwoman Becky Patel and Susan Buse because your works on the Sustainability Committee have been very inspiring the way that you're so involved in representing your wards in the city of Clayton, Matt Malik and David Gibson for really just putting in so much work to be able to spread the word. Tina Murtha is the social media kind of outreach um, communications person, and she runs um, um, on the Clayton website, the part about the Sustainability Committee, and she does an amazing job with that. Um, Carol Klein, me and her worked on an article about native yards um, for the committee, and she her work is incredible. And I really just want to thank the city of Clayton, all the MIAC people that are here tonight, and the Board of Aldermen for really just caring about your community. So thank you all. Hello, Board of Aldermen and Mayor Harris. I'm Story Coomer and I'm a junior at John Burroughs High School. I've been attending plan commission and architectural review board meetings this past year. It's been interesting to hear about different properties represented by both architects and homeowners and hear what the board suggests. I've enjoyed following certain houses as they come in again after having made certain staff recommended changes and then seeing them get passed and approved in both the site plan and architectural review processes. I also appreciate how the meetings are open to the public because sometimes neighbors come in and give points of views that are interesting and different and wouldn't be considered through a strictly architectural point of view. So I have a couple observations from this past year. First, I found it fascinating how much time was spent trying to assess the fit of a particular house to a neighborhood. Every detail is reviewed to ensure that each house matches both the style and the size on the street to create unity. For example, at the most recent meeting on May 12th, they were looking at plans for a new construction on University Drive. The council picked up on a detail that I would have missed, how many steps led up to the house just to make sure that it wouldn't overshadow neighboring houses, which was really interesting. So I think this balance of unique architectural styles with some commonality can be seen throughout Clayton, even just walking around. And it was cool to see where that stemmed from. Second, I didn't realize how big of an issue water was, specifically the buildup and runoff of water. During the meetings, I learned about permeable versus semi-permeable materials and what was best for specific locations, and as well as plants that are designed to absorb more water. Because water continues to be a relevant issue, I believe if homeowners were educated about this, they may want to be part of the solution. So one idea could be giving small tax breaks to homeowners who plant a certain number of water-absorbing plants. Another recommendation I have for the board is to make a larger effort to reach out to community members to inform them of the changes going on, specifically things being built, kind of echoing what Gavin said. I learned about a new park being constructed through NYIC near the library, but a lot of adult residents of Clayton that I know didn't know about it. So I know there are many great plans for our future and there are surveys and open houses, but many residents didn't know those existed and they would love to be part of the conversation. 
In conclusion, it's been an honor to attend and occasionally participate in the Plan ARB meetings, as well as to learn more about the local government of Clayton. I really enjoyed touring the police and fire departments and getting a closer work at the inner workings of where we live. Finally, I would like to thank the Board of Aldermen, Mayor Harris, Ms. Abelis, and Ms. Kearley for helping us with MYAC. And thank you, and I look forward to finding more ways to engage in my local community. Okay, then just to top it off, those were fantastic presentations. I know that we have this recorded so we can go back and, and recapture all of those wonderful ideas that you guys came up with. Thank you for your time and your thoughts there. Really nicely done. Um, at each year, we, we try really hard to identify one or two students that really kind of go above and beyond what the normal expectations are for MIAC. I think this year, honestly, I could say almost every one of you did this. Uh, you really, really um, shot the moon. But two students really stood out a little bit more. And um, so we're going to recognize them. And if they will come up here, I have a gift for each of them. And that will be uh, Charlie and Story. Thank you to the advisors, Ms. Abelis and Darcy. Thank you so much. And we will get you your flowers for tonight. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, um, great. All right, well, thank you to everyone else for being patient as we went through that. Um, I, I have to say this, this is the, this is my fifth Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, and this is definitely the best group in five years. So they just all did a really, really great job. Um, and thank you to our directors who had them at their meetings, Tony, Anna, Karen, you didn't get to have them because you don't really have those kind of meetings. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> board meetings. Okay. Chief, you too. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. Now we're going to move on and we have a presentation um, on our audit report. Um, and we, yeah, would you please step forward and you have the floor. Bailey with Sikich, and we're the auditors for the city of Clayton. So we have two reports to go over tonight. The big one is the annual comprehensive financial report. I will just try and summarize this as best as I can. And then if anybody has questions, um, feel free to interrupt me or um, I'll ask again at the end. The second one is our board report. Um, I'll go over that second. So the first one is this large report, the annual comprehensive financial report. And um, first um, is a transmittal letter of the government. And uh, one important thing to note is that the city was awarded the GFOA certificate for 2021. Um, at the time that we issued this, the, the certificate for 2022 wasn't issued yet, but it has since been issued. Um, so that's great to know because that's um, a distinguished honor it kind of means that the city went above and beyond just a regular financial report. Um, Next, uh, this lists the principal officials, um, the city's org chart. And then finally, um, on page one is our on our letterhead, um, it states independent auditors report. And this is our report on the financial statements. Um, and the main apart, the main important part of this um, report is just the opinion. And that is that everything's um, the financial statements of the governmental activities, each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information is presented fairly in all material respects. So that's a clean unmodified opinion. So that's important to know um, for the city. Finally, um, I'll go over the management's discussion and analysis on page five. So this provides a great summary and overview um, of what occurred during the year for the city's um, government-wide financial statements and the major funds. So I will hit more on this and then I will kind of um, open it up for any questions on some more of the detailed information in the back. Um, but regarding um, the statement of net position and then the uh, statement of activities. So this is uh, the city's government-wide financial statements. These include all funds. So all funds are blended together and then it, it's on a full accrual basis. So it includes the capital assets, the debt, um, the pension liability and OPEB liability. Um, so the total net position at the end of the year was 112.5 million which was an increase from last year's 111 million. Um, on page nine, the statement of activities, this shows the revenues and expenses with all funds combined. Um, the revenues stayed consistent, but the overall changes within the categories. So um, capital grants and contributions decreased approximately 107,000. That varies each year, just based on what the projects the city has going on. Um, sales tax increased 670,000 or 6%, which is due to the increased activity in the area, the increased spending due to the recovering economy. Um, utility tax increased 1.1 million or 23%. And this is just mainly due to a charter settlement that came in during the year. It was approximately 650,000 or so. Um, the ARPA funds that was received last year, so there was no ARPA funds received this year. And then um, investment income, that increased approximately 1.2 million, 181%, mainly just due to the, the state of the economy, um, increased interest rates. Um, so program expenses, those increased approximately 7.7%. And the majority of this increase is just due to um, the changes in the non-uniform and uniform pension plans. Um, so that's the cause of those increases. Um, then on the city's funds, so the city has three major funds, um, the general fund, the capital improvement fund, and the equipment replacement fund. 
Um, the city's total governmental funds at the end of the uh, 2023 reported an ending fund balance of 44.9 million, which is an increase of 3.5 million from the prior year. All three of those funds showed increase in fund balances. So the general fund, which is the main operating fund of the city, had total fund balance of 23.4 million, an unassigned fund balance of 23.2 million. So that unassigned fund balance represents 79% of total general fund expenditures. Um, the city's policy is 25% of expenditures with a goal of 50 and a take action point of 40. So the city is well above that. Um, the city's fiscal year fund balance increased 1.7 million. Uh, the largest increases was due to revenue from sales tax, that charter um, that we discussed earlier in investment income. Uh, the capital improvement fund balance of 6.4 million, which is restricted for capital projects. Um, this increased 760,000, which is due to recurring revenue as well as grant and donation revenue exceeding expenditures. Um, the equipment replacement fund, had an ending total fund balance of 9.4 million, um, which increased uh, by 421,000, which is mainly just due to the charge back to the capital improvement fund, um, and then some of the funding from the general fund. And this uh, fund balance can vary each year, just depending upon the replacement schedule of capital items purchased. Um, the general fund, so since, Variances in the budget to actual and the general fund. The general funds, um, the total revenues were 272,000 more than budget and the expenditures um, were 47,000 less than budget. So that's kind of the direction that you'd like to see in both of those items. Um, the capital assets totaled uh, 95.9 million as of the end of the year. It did decrease about 2.3 million, which is mainly due to one year's worth of depreciation expense greater than the capital asset additions for this particular year. Um, Long-term debt decreased about 2.5 million. So it went from 27.7 million to 25.1 million. And that's due to the city having no additional debt and then the payment of principal on each of the um, city's debt issuances. Um, so that is kind of a brief summary of, um, of the, the government-wide and then the major funds. Um, the following pages shows more detailed information. So um, pages 14 and 15 shows more detailed information on the statement of net position, and that's the one that sh blends all the funds and is on a full accrual basis. Um, so if you wanted to see line items for what makes up the assets, deferred outflows, liabilities, and deferred inflows in that position, that would show you that. Um, the statement of activities is kind of like the income statement for the governments, government-wide. Um, and then following that are the fund statements. So this shows a column for each of the major funds and then one column for the total aggregate remaining funds, the non-major funds. Um, on page 18, you can see a total fund balance of all the funds of that 44.9 million. Um, and then on page 21 shows you the changes. So it shows you the revenues, expenditures, and then change in fund balance for all those funds as well. Um, so the total fund balance increased 3.5 million. Following those statements, um, is a statement of fiduciary net position on page 23, along with the statement of changes in fiduciary net position on page 24. And this is for the city's pension trust funds. So this is um, a blended statement for the non-uniform and uniform pension trust funds. Um, I guess it'd be, it, it's important to note on page 24 that the net position increased about 4.2 million. So it went from 71 million to 75 million. And that's mainly due to the net appreciation and the fair value of the investments due to the economy, the interest rates. Um, on pages 25 through, um, through 71 is the notes to the financial statements. So this is part of the basic financial statements. This shows a lot of detailed information 
on the city's um, accounting policies, cash and investments. Um, it states that the bank balances were fully secured. That's important for the city to know. Um, it shows a lot of details on investments. So you can see the fair value of investments by investment type and maturities. Um, capital assets, it shows more detailed information by capital asset type. Um, same with long-term debt. Long-term debt, you could see each of the city's um, bond issuances rather than it just being totaled up. There's a lot of pension and OPEB information um, on contributions, benefit payments, the changes in the liability amounts. Um, I won't go over this. It, they don't. The layout of the notes don't really change from year to year, but the amounts, of course, are updated with the financial changes in the activity in the year. Um, anybody have any questions so far? Am I keeping? It's a good time for you to ask. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of information here. There is. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still way back on one of the first things that you okay. said. So, and I just didn't understand it. So mm -hmm. on page nine of the report, you mm -hmm. went through the um, the changes um, that had occurred. And one of the things I thought I heard you say was the uh, noting the significant increase in expenses um, for public safety, um, the $5 million or so, 5.1. Uh -huh. And I thought what I heard you say was that that was largely due to pension costs. Mm -hmm. Is If so, please explain that. I Yep. Not familiar why that would occur. Yep. So um, I can show you the note disclosure too that provides more information. Um, so that would be for the uniform pension fund. Um, and there were um, changes in benefit terms. So there was um, probably an increase in the service costs and the changes of benefit terms. Let me. Rick, I had asked David that same question, and he said it was entirely related to the way we shifted, like, pension costs. So, yeah, I mean, it's a huge difference, but David didn't really answer. Yeah. And then... What page is that? The question? Um, so, probably page 77 is a good page to look at. This is the uniformed, um, detail of the uniform employees pension fund. This would at least provide more of an answer to the question. Um, but you can see changes of benefit terms of 707,000. Um, we, we also changed the plan's valuation date from January 1st to October 1st. Mm -hmm. And that, yep. sh that shift would have- Would that account would, for that, 5 million? That would have made an impact. I'm not sure if it was the full 5 million. Well, I don't know if it was this year or prior year, but we also changed the percentage. From 6.75 to 7%. Which, in, which, which, which bumped that up some, but I think that change in date resulted in the biggest okay. yeah. chunk of that. It also looks like they updated the salary scale assumptions um, based on numbers of years of service, updated retirement, termination and disability rates. Um, they adjusted the amortization wage inflation. Um, so that's the main cause of, of that increase. So I, I certainly understand changing benefit terms and I understand, um, that if we change the percentages, those kinds of things would have an impact. And so, but it also seemed to me, we also had some, um, salary adjustments. And so all I'm trying to discern is the difference between what would have been, um, uh, current compensation versus pension compensation in that that significant difference. Um, so if you looked at, let's see, the general funds, um, you go to the fund general funds budget to actual. So on page 72, this would show you the expenditures um, so it, it would show you by department. So you could see, let's see, public safety um, is 13.7 um, million and it was budgeted to be 13.7 million. So it was right on point with budget. Um, I'm not exactly sure compared to last year's just because there's not comparative statements. I'd have to look at, um, I'd have to go back and look at last year's, but this actually, this doesn't, this like, 
fund doesn't account for like the changes in the pension. So this would be more on like the basis that you would budget. It's on the modified accrual. So it would have the like employer contributions extent like um, expended on here, but it wouldn't have the changes in the liability and the benefit terms included in there if that's Right. So oh, I, I serve on the non-uniform committee. So I'm familiar with okay. the actuarial aspects and the funding. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that the, to see the magnitude of a $5 million change is just what I, I'd like to understand that better, mm -hmm. especially in terms of looking to what the future is like. Is this a significantly increasing cost that we're going to face or is this a one-time kind of a thing and then understand what the difference is? My understanding is it's a one-time um, but that might be a better question for the um, actuary. But yeah, I'm, that's my understanding from that, uh, speaking with the actuary in finance. Okay, thank you. Well, just, you know, to make sure, is is that something, David, that we can follow up on and, and yeah, really clarify yep. for the whole group um, at some point soon? Yes, yes, okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good question. Um, you have more to say, I assume, or do we have more questions right at the moment? Does anybody have any more questions? I just okay. had, oh. I just had one more on the, on the notes. Uh -huh. I mean, you, you list out some of the Gatsby adjustments that are coming out in note 15 and at a mm -hmm. high level, anything we should be concerned about, anything we need to be thinking about going for the next couple of years, it could affect the way our audit looks and the way we need to do business. Um, the only one that is um, somewhat significant that's a change is compensated absences. And that just would require the city to look at the compensated absences policy for sick leave and um, vacation. And if there is some um, time that is, say it's not paid out, but it vests and it can be used for like accumulated time off, that would then have to be accrued on the government wide statements um, rather than just like currently right now, the city just books a liability for any vacation or sick leave um, or any comp time that would get paid out upon retirement or termination. Um, but this requires you to actually book a liability for any time um, that could be used um, in the next couple like years. It wouldn't have to necessarily be paid out. So that kind of changes um, the scope of how compensated absences are recorded. And, and, and therefore, I assume change the way our liabilities overall mm -hmm. net out and the way our fund balance nets out and kind of all that. Okay. And that would mainly just be like government-wide um, entry. Right. So it shouldn't affect the individual funds too much. Right. Yeah, very good. All right, that's that's it. I, that, well, that's a lot of the big report. Well, Yes, it's a very big report. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Alden Bader. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yep, so this is the second report that I was going to go over, and that's our report. <laughs> no, no. You're, you're, it's a good intro to the second report. Um, so yeah, the second report is our report to the board. <laughs> um, so it kind of states um, any significant audit matters, um, the main estimates, so the main estimates of depreciation expense, and then, of course, the net pension liability, OPEB liability, 
we would disclose if there were any difficulties difficulties encountered during the audit. There were none. Any corrected and uncorrected misstatements, which we can go over as well. Um, and any other matters. Um, the uh, There was one um, past adjustment and it was immaterial and it was just to record um, the effect of the CRSWC portion of the non-uniform plan. Um, so we record that on the city's financial statements rather than breaking it out on CRSWC in the city because it's immaterial. So, but it is above a certain amount that we start have to tracking um, immaterial adjustments just to make sure in total and aggregate that they're not material. So that was the one. Um, it was similar to last year as well. Um, the communication of deficiencies in internal control and other comments to management. So this would disclose if there were any material weaknesses. Um, we did not discover any. And then we did note some kind of like operating um, comments for management um, of where they could improve. And um, they're, yeah, they're called deficiencies, but it's not a significant deficiency. It's just kind of a control deficiency. So that's important to note in case you heard of those terms and think of deficiency as uh, significant, but it's not. Um, on page eight, yeah, the deposit liabilities. So these are the amounts that the city receives. Um, and in order to pay them back when they're, um, when, you know, that's appropriate, the city should be tracking these amounts so they know who they're owed to and then when the project's complete and the status of that so that they can appropriately be refunded or the city can remit them to revenue if that's if that's what should occur. Um, so I know that the city is working on this. Um, I think it's a it was a big undertaking because I think it, you know it's years and years of um, information that maybe wasn't always there. Um, so the city is working on that. Um, pooled cash. So the city's pooled cash is with uh, CRSWC. And so since CRS CRSWC had a negative balance, it's kind of like the city is effectively loaning them money. So um, our recommend recommendation would be that the city could consider establishing a separate bank account for CRSWC. Um, in order to avoid this situation from reoccurring or that we recommend that the city have some kind of controls to prevent the CRSWC from overspending its share. And then the final comment is on the bank reconciliations. So the bank reconciliation was not reconciled timely and the reconciliation had a difference of approximately 40,000 um, as of our audit field work date. Um, and it was later discovered and corrected in March 2024. So we just recommend that the city continue to improve its bank reconcili pre reconciliation process to ensure timely and accurate reconciliations. Um, and after speaking with finance, they've instituted some new procedures and some, um, some extra reviews too to make sure that that gets um, completed timely and accurately. Okay, very good. Any other questions? We yeah, I just want to follow up. And, and I know that we've had a, um, at least in the past, some either short, we were short staffed or we were, um, had new staff. In, in your observations, any particular concerns other than the ones that you cited um, about separation of duties or uh, controls at all? Are, are we adequately staffed to have that separation of duties? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to ask, because I think we've talked about the CRSWC account issue before, and I somewhat suspect it's by design almost that it works this way because we know it's not adequately funded in general. <laughs> um, and so what I can't remember from when we talked about this before is um, what if any like penalty or problem this poses for the city. Like do we have like, I don't believe we actually incur any like fees or it doesn't hurt our rating or like, are there any adverse consequences of this? It's just that the cash situation. is commingled with, with the city's cash. So if they had a massive loss, that's, that's hitting our account uh, because we build that deficit basically the, the next year. 
So we look at what that deficit is, and then we, we split that amount the next fiscal year to, to make up that difference. So we're basically floating that from year to year. The way to get around it would be uh, to set up a separate account that CRSWC would, would basically have their their own account that sits there, but you almost have to pre-fund it knowing that they're going to run a deficit so that you have something to draw from until you can get those those payments the following fiscal year to shore that back up. Uh, and they don't have the type of balance that would allow them to really float that. So historically, we've just commingled it with the city's cash and, and we floated that that deficit. Yeah, and so just to, it doesn't actually like have an opportunity cost to us or cost us anything. With a large right. amount or we were shorter on cash, then it could potentially right. cause an issue. Okay. So I, I would just add that in terms of my observation on that, okay. it would be um, you better have a good relationship with your joint venture partner. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And if for whatever reason you didn't and they um, said, this is a big surprise to us, uh, we're not going to pay, then we're left holding the bag. And so I don't think that's the circumstances at all, but that would be um, a potential downside and then the loss of cash. So you want to make sure that the um, operation is adequately capitalized. And so, you know, we'd end up paying either part of it one way or the other. Um, it's just that we're paying the school uh, district's portion as we go forward, it seems to me. And I'll just add to that, too. I think that um, the, the amount that we're carrying, everything is approved prior to the expenditure by both parties, I would assume. If there's any way that, if there's any way it could be a surprise and we should change this this procedure right away, but if because the expenditures all are approved by the joint board prior to the expenditure, hopefully, yeah, there I, is that. I would just add it. I mean, I, I've served a couple of times. Bridget's been there all the time. But yes, we have regular meetings and go through the financials regularly. There should be no surprise. We have a very detailed financial report every time. So you're you're right. It should get along well. I agree with you on that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a legal agreement in place that obligates them. Um, we wouldn't want to have to like we we do and again they're approving those expenditures board, along the way but, yeah. uh, so the only thing that really would put you in a bad in bad shape is if there was some big unforeseen like capital expense that might come up um and you try to figure out how to fund that but i think if it was going to be some sort of impairment to our accounts then we would have that discussion up front about how we would tackle that particular charge thank you okay great thank you other comments or questions from anyone Bader. This is very quick, and this may actually be more for uh, Kevin and David, but your report talks about tax abatement mm -hmm. and um, and talks about uh, tax abatement, and I think this is all related to the Centene Project, Chapter 100 and Chapter 5353, that in total the amount of city property taxes abated by these arrangements during the year ended September 30th, 2023, was approximately $305,000. I just don't recall, and I would like to know: Does that are we going to see that same number in the in the up in this current fiscal year? Because I know there was some question as to when the tax abatement stopped being in effect. You will. Uh, the tax abatement will go off. It's January first of twenty five. So we we still will have one more year left. I assume probably approximately the same amount. Okay. Thank you. Hey, very good. Um, great job. I, I want to just say, um, I always find the most, it's all interesting, <laughs> but the most interesting stuff to me is always the very last few pages in like the appendix that show the history of our debt and oh, our, our uh, yeah. different, you know, uh, property tax, sales tax, um, all the, all the historical information is really helpful. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for having me here tonight. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, without further ado, um, I will open the public hearing and request proof of publication for number four, Forest Ridge. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Yes, this is a public hearing and subsequent resolution to consider granting a conditional use permit to Josephine Weil, revocable trust, owner of four Forest Ridge Place, to allow for the construction of a 588 square foot accessory structure containing an accessory dwelling unit. The property has a zoning designation of R1 large lot single family dwelling district. The plan commission and architectural review board considered the applications and associated architectural and site plans for the project on April 15th, 2024, 
and recommended approval of the CUP and approved the architectural and site plans. An, ex an accessory dwelling unit, or ADU, is a type of accessory structure, either attached or detached, which provides complete independent living facilities for one or more persons and is located on the same site as the principal residence. The plan commission unanimously recommended approval of the CUP with the following conditions. First, that all conditions of chapter 405, article two, which is section 405.330 shall be adhered to. Secondly, the applicant shall record a deed restriction pursuant to item number three under criteria for review and submit proof of the required deed restriction to the city prior to the, issue, the issuance of a building permit. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen conduct a, a public hearing and consider approving the resolution granting a conditional use permit for a 588 square foot detached ADU for four Forest Ridge Place. Okay, very good. Um, the applicants are here. Is there anything you would like to say or come to address the board? It's not necessary, but if you'd like to. Very good. Thank you. Uh, does anybody, would anyone like to hear from the architect? Okay, very good. Any questions for the applicant? Comments there? Yes, Mr. Fader. Uh, just one question. I, I, I'm perfectly fine with the application. I just, I think it's sort of implicit here, but is it the it looks like it's the applicant's plan to sell the property at three forest ridge once the new house on at number four is available or is that is no, that sir they do not i, I don't no, know there is they, no there is no present plan to sell number three uh who knows what the future might bring but there okay. there is no plan i, I don't think it's necessary to for the application i was just curious what the plan was let me clarify one thing this is not new construction this is a renovation of probably a hundred year old uh, existing carriage house garage. There's a garage, I think a three car garage on the first level. There is a, an apartment, if you will, on the second level. Uh, nothing's been done to it as far as we can, as far back as we can tell. And it's in, in connection with the construction of a new house on number four that you um, heard about. Uh, uh, that we thought it was time to to uh, fix up the uh, carriage house. Very good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any discussion? All right. Then I will close the public hearing. Alderman McAndrew. I will move to approve resolution number 2024-06, granting a conditional use permit for four Forest Ridge Place to allow for an accessory dwelling unit. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. And again, thank you for your patience. And I am going to come see your garden. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, moving on. And, and we're going to move on with our agenda, so there's no further action on your item. If you would like to stay, you're welcome, but no need. Yeah. Um, moving on to our consent agenda. Um, first thing is um, I would like to actually not part of the consent agenda, but I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our newest member, Jeff Yorg. Uh, welcome to the Board of Aldermen. Thank you. We didn't get I'm to still learning how to you, use the mic. I'm a little hesitant with you. Thank you. It's the best I got. <laughs> Uh, we weren't able to witness your swearing in, so but we're glad you are here. Um, also, um, in the consent agenda is the appointment of our new mayor pro tempore, older woman Bridget McAndrew. And so we have this for you. Wow. Oh, I guess I'm making this right. Uh, well, we here. haven't approved it yet. <laughs> yeah, it's a little premature. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, are we actually voting? Yeah. Yes. I mean, we have to that. approve it. I need, it. Yeah. I need okay. a motion in a second. We'll just do that with all the consent agenda then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, sorry, I gave it to you prematurely. We may be taking it back. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then, um, in just as a measure to fill these spots for um, the EDAC and also Parks and Rec that, that have been vacated by Ira's departure, um, I am recommending that we go ahead and uh, appoint Alderman Jeff Yorg to those positions. We know that uh, those those groups uh, need somebody pretty quickly and um, we will be revisiting all this again in like a month or two. So um, we can, again, if we can, we can always make changes at that time. So I'd like to recommend that. And last but not least, um, St. Louis County uh, Council for the University of Missouri Extension Service, you know, we, they require us to appoint a representative to sit on that board and Alderwoman Buse has been doing that generously and now has found that she can't do it further and um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was excited to to learn that this was even out there, and it's an exciting program that the university it's university outreach into the communities. And then when it came time to get the paperwork in, after I'd gone to a few meetings and I read the conflict of interest, it talked about not serving on a board served by the extensions committee, which I could you know recuse myself and all that. But especially when we talk about the orchard, possibly. Yeah, and part of our property, which, you know, the extensions might be a good uh, partner for that. I thought it was probably appropriate to give somebody else in the community the opportunity to be on that and serve uh, with the extensions. And so I stepped down and uh, I think that this appointment will be a really a good voice on that on that committee. Very good. So the recommendation is to appoint Melissa Pilot or Pilot? Pilot. Pilot. Thank you. Um, uh, to replace Alderwoman Buse on that board. So, and then the last thing in our consent agenda, of course, is always our minutes. So um, we could have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I will move to approve the consent agenda. If, if we could what? make one clarification That's on that discussion, as well. discussion, by the way. Yeah. On the, um, the mayor pro tem, um, the city attorney had looked it up, and it's actually an election of the Board of Aldermen rather than a mayoral appointment. So we just need to be clear that... Um, that the motion would be a motion to elect... To elect. Alderwoman to Do we need to pull it out? Yeah. It has to be pulled out if it has that, to be that amended, pull it right? out the consent agenda and do it separately. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's do that first, then. Um, let's go ahead and um, have that motion to... You want to make a motion to make yourself the. <laughs> I will move to approve myself as the <laughs> new <laughs> mayor pro tem. Very good. Second. How about a second? All right. All those in favor? All okay. right. Imposed. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> and then we can uh, vote on the rest of the consent agenda. So we'll, we'll have a motion for that. I will move to approve the remaining items on the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, a roll. Oh, it's a roll. Go on. We're doing <laughs> all kinds of things. Andrew? Aye. Alderman Buse? Aye. Alderman Patel? Aye. Alderman Fader? Aye. Alderman Hummel? Aye. Alderman York? I got a question. That may be out of order. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, it's all over the since place. Since I actually wasn't here for the minutes, can I abstain from that vote, but approve everything else? Or is that going to no. muck up the works? Single vote. Okay, then I. Yeah. We're fine. But you have an opportunity to read them. But you, yeah. yeah, you weren't here. But you might have been listening online. Yeah, that's okay. fair. <laughs> okay. Mayor Harris. Aye. Okay. Um, non city manager's report. Okay, first item is a condominium plat. This is an ordinance approving a condominium plat at 6601 Clayton Road. Subject property comprises one multifamily structure with four units. On, April, on May 13th, 2024, the applicant submitted a revised plat to address outstanding staff comments. The revised plat is in compliance with the applicable codes, ordinances, and standards of Article 3, condominiums, and condominium building conversions. 
Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the plat with the following conditions. First, that the applicant provide a mylar for the, uh, for the appropriate City of Clayton signatures after Board of Aldermen approval. And secondly, that the applicant shall file the plat with the St. Louis County Recorder of Deeds Office and submit proof of filing to the city within 45 days of Board of Aldermen approval. Okay, thank you. I will open the discussion. Um, no questions from the audience. Okay. Um, any comments, questions up here? All right. Go ahead. I'll introduce bill number 7024, approving a condominium plat for 6601 Clayton Road to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 70, excuse me, bill number 7024, first reading, an ordinance providing for the approval of a plat for the 6601 Clayton Road condominiums, a condominium located in the city of Clayton, Missouri. And Madam Mayor, if I may note that the uh, members of the board have received a printed copy of a revised draft of the ordinance uh, in light of the uh, new plat that was submitted, solving all the address, the comments of staff. So this is read, this is introduced in the revised version. Okay, very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Alderman McAndrew. I move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of bill number 7024 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, let the minutes reflect the board has given unanimous consent. Introduce bill number 7024 approving condominium plat for 6601 Clayton Road to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 7024, second reading and consideration for an adoption, an ordinance providing for the approval of a plat for the 6601 Clayton Road condominiums, a condominium located in the city of Clayton, Missouri. Alderwoman McAndrew? Aye. Alderwoman Buse? Aye. Alderwoman Patel? Aye. Alderman Fader? Aye. Alderman Hummel? Aye. Alderman York? Aye. Mayor Harris? Aye. Thank you. Okay, continuing on with Shop Park. Right. In 2003, Shaw Park Aquatic Center underwent a major renovation, which included replacing the HVAC system and the guard office's first aid room and concession stand. The system is now over, tw uh, over 20 years old and has required more frequent and increasingly costly repairs over the past five years. To avoid excessive maintenance costs, bid documents for HVAC replacement at Shaw Park Aquatic Center were issued on January 11, 2024. The scope of work includes the replacement of the current HVAC system, with units of similar capacity and function while providing improved efficiency. Unfortunately, we did not receive any responsive bids for that request. City staff then contacted four contractors to request quotes, and after repeated requests, the city has received one proposal for this work, which includes replacement of all HVAC units as originally requested. Staff recommends awarding the contract to Tri-State Mechanical Services as they are the low bid, can perform the work quickly and have highly re highly rated references. The whole project is expected to take approximately four to five weeks and the concession stand unit shall be completed prior to Shaw Park Aquatic Center opening for the 2024 season on May 25th. Work on other units can continue while the facility is open for the season. Funding for the project has been included in the city's capital budget for fiscal year 24 in the amount of $75,000. The total cost of the project will be $42,416.50. We also recommend inclusion of a 5% contingency of $2,100 to be used to cover any unexpected expenditures. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the ordinance authorizing a contract with Tri-State Mechanical Services Incorporated in the amount of $42,416.50 plus a $2,100 contingency to replace the HVAC system at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. Very good. Thank you. Any discussion, questions? Um, I, I looked, I mean, I'm glad, Tony, sorry to make you walk up here. I, I mean, I'm glad we were able to get a bid. Um, bad that it took us to actually, we had to like solicit, but it sounds like they do have references. So you must have. Yes, they do have references. We've checked those. We've also used them for other projects in the past. And I can report that they have not tried to oversell us. Um, 
uh, probably about mm, four years ago, we had a problem with our walk-in freezer at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. We thought we needed a whole new freezer and they said, oh no, we could sell you a whole new freezer if, if you want, but it just needs a minor repair. So we have not had the experience of having them try to oversell us for every anything. And then we did also check their references and and they uh, were quite quite good. And then it, so even though it says four to five weeks and even though it's supposed we're supposed to open the pool in like a week and a half they'll just like work on it while yes. the they can work on it yeah why the facility is open especially with some of the smaller units um they are going to try to fast track that uh the unit for the concession stand because that's really the the unit that's most in need um and they can work on the other units um you know earlier in the morning like seven o'clock eight o'clock in the morning when it's not really busy they're not going to work on saturday or sunday but they should be able to replace those one unit at a time thanks Good, good question. So, and I'm curious, why was it hard for us? Is there something about the nature of the work or is it the nature of the industry? I think it's the nature of the industry. Um, we just, yeah, we, we've had a rough time this spring trying to get bids for some of our projects. So, yeah, and we had actually reached out to this company and two other companies to let them know that we had put the project out to bid as well. And I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer for why they did not bid on it when we actually posted the bid. And then the two other, uh, three other companies actually never replied to any of our requests for bids after that. Mentioned. I, I think, do think there's a lot of work going on right now. So I have one question, Tony. Mm -hmm. um, the staff report specifically mentions the guard office's first aid room and concession stand. And my impression is that the locker rooms are in between those they aspects of the facility. So are they not? heated or cool oh, well they're or they they're ventilated the or what they're they they only have ventilation they are not air conditioned okay yeah thank you you're welcome i just have one the memo mentions um avoiding frequent increasing cost repairs and excessive maintenance costs is there some sense of what it cost us last year yeah in terms we, of maintenance like I'm, I'm just trying to put in sure. perspective we've been spending five to ten thousand a year for the last i would say three to four three to five years to get them up and running and functionally functioning correctly and it's kind of just been all of them just periodic yes it, it'll be grant it wasn't one seven. unit one year well, yeah and and sometimes there's the same like i said the concession stand is really the unit that needs the most attention and that has required the most frequent maintenance you're welcome okay very good thanks i think that'll that'll do it uh okay alderman mcandrew I'll introduce bill number 7025, approving a contract with Tri-State Mechanical Services, Inc. for the Shaw Park Aquatic Center HVAC project to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? City Attorney. Bill number 7025, first reading, an ordinance approving a contract with Tri-State Mechanical Services, Incorporated for HVAC replacement at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll move that the board give unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of bill number 7025 on the day of, day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. I'll introduce bill number 7025, approving a contract with Tri-State Mechanical Services, Inc. for the Shaw Park Aquatic Center HVAC project to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Okay, hey, any discussion? Okay, hey, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 7025, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance approving a contract with Tri-State Mechanical Services Incorporated for HVAC replacement at Shaw Park Aquatic Center. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. I'm sorry, Alderwoman Buse. Aye. <laughs> Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Alderman Hummel. Aye. Alderman York. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Last thing here, the Oak Knoll Park Foundation repair. All right. The city, of Clayton, uh, the city of Clayton entered into a lease agreement with Clayton Early Childhood Center, or CECC, for the property at number one Oak Knoll Park, effective January 1st, 2023, for a term of 10 years, plus an option period for an additional 10 years. To address water intrusion issues, that lease agreement spe specified that the city is required to make repairs to the foundation and the area of the CECC's playground prior to January 1st, 2025. 
The scope of work includes repairs to the north and west elevations of the building below grade, as well as repairs to the south elevation of the building around the playground. This includes applying a sealer to the foundation below grade and repairing any loose mortar so that waterproofing material can apl be applied to a sound wall. After two unsuccessful attempts to bid the project, the city staff contacted three contractors to request quotes for the work. The city received two proposals, the results of which were detailed in the packet. Staff recommend awarding a contract to Concrete Strategies, LLC, as they are the low bid and have a plan for the work that includes minimal disturbance to CEC's playground uh, surface, uh, surface. The full project is expected to take approximately eight weeks and is expected to be completed prior to the end of summer. Funding for the project is included in the city's capital budget for fiscal year 24 in the amount of $175,000. The total cost of the project will be $149,506. It is also recommended that we include a 10% contingency of $15,000 to be used to, be, to cover any unknown expenditures. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the ordinance authorizing a contract with Concrete Strategies LLC in the amount of $149,506 plus a $15,000 contingency for the number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation Repair Project. Okay, thank you. I'll open the discussion. Any comments from the audience or online? Uh, uh, any questions up here? I've got a question. Oh, I've, oh. I'm sorry, Tony's coming up. I, I'm just wondering, um, this is another substantial expense um, that we're incurring at Oak Knoll. Do we anticipate any more expenditures at Oak Knoll over the next year? Not the next year, I would say within the next 10 years, we're going to have to replace the windows there as well too. In but both, all buildings or both buildings or just one? No, just number one. Wow. Yeah. In, in any idea? Uh, I assume that's more than $100,000. Uh, it's probably going to be closer to 200000 At least our initial estimation would be unless there's another increasing, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, I, I can't think of the word. Inflation. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. Unless inflation gets out of hand again. <laughs> and was that was that part of the lease agreement to replace the windows too? Or is that something no. that we just do? That no. Just We're, the roof and the waterproof. We, we could decide whether or not we wanted to replace the windows. That's correct. Yes. So, I have a question as well. The foundation work, as I understand it, we were, the entire foundation is going to need the same work. Correct. We were considering that um, when we first started this project and started meeting with contractors. We do believe that this should resolve the issues um, and not having to do the entire foundation. I, I think we need to, to do this first and At see. At this time, but Correct. getting the, the long-term costs. And what I, I expressed concern that this is deferred maintenance. We didn't, we, if we, we're having trouble getting bids. Mm -hmm. And so we're addressing an immediate problem, but Am I correct that we anticipate the entire foundation? We're just not going... sure, to be honest okay. with you. I think we need to try this first. Um, this, the Concrete Strategies LLC did provide, in our opinion, a little bit more of a substantial uh, contract for the different areas, the three sides of the of the foundation that they wanted to address. Again, with the minimal disruption to the, the playground surfacing. Um, he, our staff met quite extensively with both contractors to see what they would recommend, how to stop any water intrusion. So we feel comfortable that this, this is a good, um, I don't want to say place to start. We feel comfortable that this is a solid solution right now. Or right now. Correct. I mean, I, I guess we just need to see if it works. I, we really, there has not been any foundation work done there in quite some time. So I think, I think we need to, to see we're comfortable with this, with his recommendations. Okay, and so the amount that was originally budgeted was simply for this area of it. Correct. It wasn't for the entirety. Correct. The idea is just to stop the water. Correct, yes, because that's, that's it's a licensing problem. issue for the, the child care center, so yes. But I, we are confident that what they're going to do should work. Is, is the project, let's say it doesn't work, Mm -hmm. Will they have to rip all that out to do the full wall, or can they just build on what they've done for the next? I'm they kind of think build of incremental on, cost changes. Sure, they could build on what they've done for the next. When we first started talking about this project, we thought it was going to be an enti the entire 
facility was going to have to uh, require a whole new French drain system. We don't think the contractors, neither one of them expressed that that's what they thought they needed right now. Um, so we're, we have to go with their recommendations, I guess, because they're the expert. But that's why the whole new French drain system was going to be significantly more uh, expensive. The original contractor, when we first started talking about this, also wanted to remove all of the playground surfacing um, in the child care's center's playground, not the Oak Knoll playground that the city owns, the one that they have that's fenced off. So then the child care center would have had to pay for that surfacing to replace that. So this does disturb, he's only considering uh, uh, taking out like a 12 to 18 inch strip of that surfacing. So again, that was going to be much more invasive and that's why it was going to be much more costly as well. Okay. Good. Sounds like you've come to a good solution. We think we have, I, I think we really need to see if that works. Sure. I mean, he, we do feel like it's, it's the better of the two options that we had. Good. I just have one more question. Oh, sure. and, and it's a similar question we could have asked earlier. Mm -hmm. When you don't get a bid, how did you settle on the folks that you reach out to? Like, is there, is, is there a list y'all keep? Is there yes. like, okay. Yeah, there's a list we keep um, of, of perhaps vendors we have worked with before, vendors that we've gotten other positive recommendations for. Um, sometimes we don't know anything about them. And if they do waterproofing, um, which was the case this time, if they do waterproofing work, we reach out to them and try to get them to, and this uh, project in particular, we wanted them to visit the site, look everything over and then give us a bid. And it, for some reason, um, neither one of these companies chose to bid when it was when it was uh open i guess eligible for bid i know in in particular superior waterproofing and restoration they've done other work for the city they forgot so they forgot to bid it i think this one was bid out two times so yeah which again i think kind of goes back to they have a lot of work right now <laughs> some of these companies do so it's unfortunate though you tony do you reach out to other municipalities yes yeah we'll ask them mm -hmm, yeah. who they use and you know obviously Correct. Yes. Yes. Well, I imagine just like a lot of construction and other firms, they have a hard time getting people. Yes. And that, that can really impact it. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Very good. Okay. Is that it for discussion, everyone? Okay. Um, Alderwoman McAndrew. I'll introduce bill number 7026, approving a contract with Concrete Strategies LLC for the number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation repair project to be read for the first time by title only. Second. Any discussion? Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 7026, first reading. An ordinance approving a contract with Concrete Strategies, LLC, for the number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation, number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation Repair Project. Okay. Um, yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll move that the board gives unanimous consent to consideration for adoption of bill number 7026 on the day of its introduction. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, let the minutes reflect the board is given unanimous consent. I'll introduce bill number 7026, approving a contract with Concrete Strategies LLC for the number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation repair project to be read for the second time by title only. Second. Discussion? Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 7026, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance approving a contract with Concrete Strategies LLC for the number one Oak Knoll Park Foundation Repair Project. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Alderman Hummel. Aye. Alderman York. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Hey, great. All right, unless there's any other business? No? Okay. Um, we can do a little round table. We can start with our senior elder woman. <laughs> um, from the last time we were here, um, we've had a number of CRSWC meetings. Um, I guess the main thing we're talking about is increasing our fees next year. So um, we had a big discussion at the finance meeting and then had a big discussion at the um, main CRSWC meeting. 
Um, I think we've settled on an amount that will increase, um, kind of increase across the board, which I think will kind of cover inflation and also increase an amount that, you know, I think everybody felt good about. So um, as everybody knows, there'll be a joint meeting between ourselves and the school board um, where we'll approve the budget. Um, I think it's usually in September, right? September. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's those were really fruitful discussions and Tony um, did a great job. Tony and her staff did a great job of kind of giving us different options to look at. So, um, so I, Tony, yeah, they did a, they did a great job of just kind of facilitating the discussion and providing a lot of data for us to, to look at. Um, in addition to the CRSWC meeting, we had a plan commission meeting where we just talked about a house on university and Gary and I also had a, another very, very well attended board coffee on Saturday. Um, talked about a lot of different things, but nothing crazy that stood out. So, but yeah. Good, thank you very much. All the woman views, anything? Yes, there was a uh, Parks and Rec meeting. And um, I think some of the things that the start, Rem Remembrance Park is again delayed is another surprise with the utility line and AT&T line this time. Uh, so waiting on that, uh, pool, better news pool opens the 25th, I believe, which is exciting. And we also had the discussion about the difficulty in getting the bids for the HVAC systems, but that, um, they were able, Tony was able to get that taken care of. Um, the, uh, in, in the parks are some of the shelters and the, and the, uh, uh, outhouses, what we call them, the toilets, everything have been, have been outhouses. fixed up, everything. Is comfort fixed. stations, <laughs> as I know from my time on Parks anyway, and Rec. So, so the, some work has been done there, so that's all good. Splash pads <laughs> um, being painted and will be ready. And um, so, yeah, so the parks, the parks are in good shape. Then the shelters, that's the shelters have been updated. Then there's electronic doors on the comfort facilities. Um, there was also, we also had a, um, an IRF meeting on the pensions and similar to you heard with the audit, uh, there's a change in the, the calendar and the counting of that. Uh, markets are strong. Uh, m most of our funds are, you know, at, are beating the benchmarks by just enough. So everything is good, economy is strong. Um, and so we look good there. The other, the other uh, meeting I went to I think just was that just last night was uh, was our neighborhood Claverack Park annual meeting and sat behind Mr. Ferris. But one of the comments that came up that I, I thought about is, is that there's a lot of concern with wanting to replace the neighborhood signs, the maps of the neighborhoods and things like that. So that's something that I think will be coming a request to public works and seeing where we are on that and it may be a time to start some some of our bilingual efforts with signs i don't know so yeah All the okay. thanks um i have a couple things i want to share um one is that i know someone who loves birds and spends a lot of time looking at birds and collecting them um and uh is active with the St. Louis Audubon. And I wanted to share with everyone here um, that the Audubon Society has chosen the city of Clayton this year for their bird safe program. And what that is, is a program where they um, have volunteers who go around um, it's like a handful, a few days a week, early in the morning, um, they walk around the perimeter of buildings that are potential risks for bird strikes and observe whether there are stunned or dead birds um, that have been impacted by that. So I thought it was pretty cool that they're doing it in Clayton. Um, they did it in downtown a few years. Um, similar programs have happened like on Wash U's campus, the Danforth campus. Um, but one of the reasons they talked about choosing the city of Clayton is because many of our buildings have local ownership and they believe that the um, building owners and the city itself are likely to be receptive to any recommendations that they might make. 
So I thought that was nice. Um, anecdotally, they're not finding a ton of birds, but that's, you know, just based on very limited Man, anecdotal Matt's evidence. team is getting their first. So, um, so I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, I wanted to also um, share that I'm going to be going to a meeting in Columbia of an organization called Local Progress. Um, and they're like the Missouri that's inviting local um, municipal leaders in Missouri to gather to talk about um, collaborative governance and options for combating preemption. So if anyone is interested in that, um, I'd be happy to share more about it um, and invite you to join, see what we can do um, collaboratively. And um, I would like to commend you, Mayor, for the work that you have done um, to grow and improve the MIAC program. Um, I think the presentations tonight were excellent, um, really interesting. And even more than that, I know, um, I think it was new this year to have them like follow a committee and that felt like a really cool way for them to get a little more connected hands-on experience so I think I don't know if that was your idea or someone else's but it was excellent thank you. so thank you for doing that um, I know on I mean Charlie and Addie and Bridget shared what they did with sustainability but they were really like impressive active members of that committee um, and the stuff they did at the high school and the materials they put together that the city I think has been able to use also just really phenomenal so um so I think that's great thank you for your work on that um I wanted to talk I don't think we've met since we had I don't think we've done a round table since the last sustainability meeting and the other thing I wanted to highlight from that is um, that committee's use of interns. So um, I'm sure Matt can talk more about it. Um, and I believe it requires a fairly active involvement by staff and or the committee chair to like set that up, get it in place and make it work. Um, but it's been really, I believe transformative in terms of our ability to um, like make progress and complete activities and um, things that we have wanted to do. Um, so that's awesome. Deb Grossman and Matt have, are, have made that possible, I believe. Um, they are celebrating that we are now Soul Smart Silver certified. Um, so we were already bronze. That one was like kind of easy to get based on what we had already done and silver required a few extra things that the city completed. So um, thanks to our staff for um, for getting that done and, and prioritizing it. Um, and they're also requesting a grant to establish um, funding um, to work on Green Dining Alliance stuff, which I think would be awesome. I would love to see us make progress on that. Um, Last thing I'll share is that we've had a lot of time spent with our neighborhoods talking about the city's proposal um, to create overlays um, on the Big Bend Concordia um, campus and the South 40. Um, and I would love to share with the board that I um, am like everything that I know and believe leads me to be very supportive of the overlay process. And I really appreciate the extensive work that staff has put into it um, and, and the many attempts to get public feedback um, to incorporate into it. I continue to be concerned about this, um, the resident perception that we are giving something away by going to it um, versus the conditional use permit. Um, and I, it doesn't feel like an isolated perspective. Like there are many residents of like 
various demographics and like general personalities even and stuff who have who have continued to say to me that they believe we are giving something away by a bit by switching to the overlays versus a conditional use permit I don't see that and so I'm like really struggling to like interrogate like why does this continue to come up I don't see it at all, really. Um, and so I just would encourage us to like continue to try to like wrestle with that and think about like the questions we can ask and the proposals we can make that ensure that we are taking that concern seriously because I don't think it's isolated. And I want people to feel heard about it. And I want to make sure that we are actually addressing it so thank you i heard those concerns too because yeah I heard almost all those yeah. yeah so yeah okay good we will work on that great that's what we need special powerpoint <laughs> yeah i think it will be instructive once washu has their meetings uh that would help us yeah we start hearing after because there's it's there's a lot of ambiguity right now on that end, and so that's just creating you know further concerns. Alderman Fader, uh, I just want to comment. I appreciate the fact that David and June, I think, have continued to work on the handout that deals with our various committees. Uh, there's an expanded version of it, which I think helps. I still find it a little bit hard to decipher, but I'll I'll work on it. But anyway, we're certainly moving in the right um, direction. Um, I wanted to commend the mayor for something else, which is her work on behalf of the county municipal league, since I will not be at the next meeting because it's the night of Clayton High School graduation, where I think the mayor will make her last appearance there. But I did attend the meeting on uh, April 25th, which she ran, at, which was at the Armstrong Teasdale offices, uh, dealing with the problem of the unhoused, particularly the speaker was from the city of St. Louis. <laughs> It turns out, as a matter of fact, that he went to Clayton High School, I found out. His father was an art teacher at the high school. Anyway, he gave a very nice presentation. Again, not, not very positive in terms of easy solutions. It's obviously a very difficult problem, but the more we find out about it, the easier it is, I think, at some point to tell the community what we've learned and what we're doing about it. Um, I did, by the way, attend one of the Wash U Concordia, smaller meetings. My daughter lives on Alamo. And so I thought I would go to the DeMond meeting. Uh, I, I thought David and Anna and Mal did an excellent job. I agree with the concern. I, I, I hear that as well in Ward 3. I hear it from people in Ward 1. But I think that's probably a topic for a, a larger discussion and probably not tonight. Um, uh, I've, I've been going to a series of programs put on by the Business Journal. Uh, about regional issues. The most recent one was essentially how we're not doing a great job marketing the St. Louis region. Um, it, it sort of boiled down to one of the speakers saying we need to stop blanking on ourselves and you can fit in the profanity, but his, his point was we're too negative. We don't promote enough about our own community. Um, those programs tend to still be city oriented and not always a lot about the county, but uh, but they're instructive. And there's another one later in the month about sort of the economic outlook for, for the region. Uh, as Bridget uh, mentioned, we, we seem to have 15 people who come every Saturday, every time we do this at Starbucks from Ward 3. Um, and they're good sessions. We always get some of the repeat customers, but we always get new people. And uh, we all also get uh, Alderman Berger Ex Alderman Berger and Steve Lichtenfeld always attend our meetings, so makes it interesting. Eighth and uh, let's see if I had anything else. I, we I, I attended the uh, the Uniform Pension Board meeting yesterday. Sounds like generally things are going are going well. Um, I, I did want to comment that I I went to the Washington University Law School commencement exercises yesterday because it was my my class's fiftieth anniversary fiftieth reunion from law school. But my point was it was it was it was it was not only well attended, but it was without incident. And I think that was the true of the undergraduate effort as well. And I think kudos to I know David worked on it, obviously Chief Smith and a lot of the other uh, police departments, uh, city, county, et cetera. And, and so I, th I think that was part of the reason that those uh, 
those things went off well yesterday. So appreciate that effort. Uh, I attended the um, um, uh, the the open streets program on Sunday at around eleven thirty. Uh, I thought it was it looked like a really neat program with a lot of neat stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't see many people there, and so I guess we have to evaluate perhaps why that was. But anyway, it looked like a neat effort and a lot of people from the staff participated and somehow it still didn't, from what I heard, attract a lot of people. So I guess we need to think about that. So, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, unique things, so I'll just add on some of the things we've already addressed. And so regarding the um, CRSWC, Bridget mentioned the uh, fee increase. And so at least from my perspective, the last time we met jointly with the school board, they the school board members seem to be, um, in my opinion, very, very focused on financials, financial performance, and how to um, mitigate the operating shortfalls. And so I just want to give um, credit to the staff that's been working very hard on implementing a marketing program that is seeing some success in terms of membership growth that the um, board continues to encourage um, uh, that marketing focus. And so the fee increase that we did discuss is a combination of trying to address uh, cost recovery, but also not to price ourselves out of the market so that there is a lot of competition um, from a variety of other uh, centers. And so um, I, I thought we struck what I thought was a very um, uh, good strategy overall. So just a comment on that. Um, the non-uniformed uh, pension fund had its meeting, and similarly, um, just this was primarily a focus on the economic and market um, as assessment. Our overall funding continues to be consistent and, and um, strong. Um, regarding the overlay neighborhood uh, meetings, we've had several of those, and I guess my observation to, um, I, I agree with Becky's observations, and what I would add to that is that um, as I listen to the various presenters of the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, um, almost without exception, every one of them talked about how um, generally unaware they were and how we need to do a better job of communicating. And so I've learned through a life, you can never communicate enough, um, no matter how good you're out, you are at it. Um, and so... The thing that's been apparent to me in these meetings is that no matter how hard and how much David and Anna modify their presentations, um, we have to remember that the, our residents um, don't have that level of familiarity. And so no matter how basic we might think it is, um, we need to treat it, um, I think, very basically. And so it just simple things like understanding what the alternative would be if we didn't try to address this proactively. I don't think they understand that. Um, understanding what the overall role is. And so positively, there are people that get it, thankfully, and they do, they are complimentary about um, thanking the city and the staff and uh, for, for engaging in this process on the front end. But it takes a lot of repetition. And unfortunately, we don't have we get new people that show up at this from time to time. That's good. We're getting lots of public engagement. It's frustrating that we have to reinvent the wheel each time. So anyway, that's um, just a recurring theme. Um, and so I, I just think um, we've got more to do there. And I, and I hope, David, that you'll make a comment a little bit about just in terms of what we'd expect from a calendar standpoint about this process. Um, as we go forward because, and then kind of tie it all in, in terms of what that will be um, or how it'll affect us as a board. So my understanding is Washington University will be sending out those invitations, hopefully tomorrow morning. Uh, they were saying this afternoon or, or tomorrow uh, to get meetings set up uh, as soon as next week. So um, we've, we've got holds already on, on calendars for things and uh, they just need to get those letters out to the, to the neighborhoods. So that people can see that. So that's the next step because we're interested in hearing what WashU has to say as well. Uh, Concordia will be at those meetings, but I, I know folks are showing up to hear what WashU has to say. So we're going to basically play the role WashU played at our meetings. So we're going to sit in the back and listen to what they had to say. Uh, there have been a lot of questions that have come up about their intentions with the Fonfon campus, um, questions about pilots, questions about their intentions on these particular sites. 
So those are all things they're going to have to address uh, that you know we're really unwilling to to talk about because it's 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 not our long term plan. Uh, so um, that's going to be uh, I think pretty informative for us. Uh, I also think there's going to be some degree, hopefully, of, of deal making at those meetings uh, between the residents and, and the university over uh, the, the various things that we've talked about. So you know, sound limits. When can you actually turn lights off? Can we cut that shorter? Uh, can you cut down the number of, of people that will be attending events? Those types of things. I think there's going to be a lot of conversation like that. So uh, that's going to be interesting to see. We, we have adjustments that, that we want to make to that overlay, and it doesn't actually take a lot of time to, to go in and, and make those changes. That's something Anna and I could come up with in a couple of hours and, and be done with a final draft. Um, I agree that we need to find a way uh, to simplify the message. Uh, we're already working on a table that kind of compares uh, what they could do right now under a CUP versus what the overlay would do. Uh, when you stack those up side by side, you start to see that the overlay is much more restrictive. The city attorney just made a great point a little while ago about um, administrative versus legislative decisions and the fact that a conditional use permit, you're applying laws that are already on the books, uh, where if you're doing an overlay, you're actually legislating uh, you know, the rules under which they'll operate. Um, and you have a lot more uh, authority that way. So finding a way to, to package that message as well uh, with that table, I, I think will help to simplify the conversation or at least that portion of it that relates to CUP versus overlay. Um, and really driving home the point that uh, the, the overlay is, is the city preempting all this. It's the city taking action. We're not responding to an application from Wash U to do this, we recognize that it's coming and we want to control what happens uh, better than we can currently. And so um, it's continuing to, to work on that message for residents, uh, but the changes and the adjustments themselves, that it's not going to be difficult to put that together. Uh, so timeline, after observing the meetings with Wash U, I'm sure we'll have another meeting with them. Uh, we've got a couple of, of residents that kind of represent other folks in their neighborhoods that I have been in close contact with us. I'm sure we'll have a few more conversations with them as well, but we're still tracking towards early summer to get something in front of the plan commission and, and have some formal overlays ready to, to be addressed. Right. And then uh, we were, um, I, I know that there have been neighbors that have uh, asked for special meetings. And so we just got another neighborhood association that asked to meet with Becky and I, and hopefully next week. And so we, they haven't told us what in particular, other than they're more worried about the South 40 um, than they are about the Big Bend okay. overlay. And, so. and we've accommodated those along the way as well. So as, as people have reached out to have separate meetings, we've, we've done that. And uh, we'll continue to, uh, again, try to simplify the message. It's not an intuitive thing to explain an overlay district and all of those parameters and what we're trying to achieve. And it's, um, it's, it's right. complicated. It takes us almost an hour just to get through what it is we're trying to accomplish uh, and finding a way to shorten that up uh, so that people understand it easily is, is, is difficult. So we had, you know, I had a resident email me, I think it was Mark Bade. He emailed me, why don't you do a before and after? And I emailed you that. So I'm glad to see that you guys are doing that. That, that I think if you can do, here's now, here's after, the benefits of that are so clear when you put it side by side, and that was a good idea on your one of your constituents' parts. Okay, uh, Alderman Yorg. I don't have a lot, as you okay. probably can imagine, but I, so, so there's a couple of things. So one, um, thank you all for the warm welcome, and, and I've chatted with many of you, and I will probably chat with all of you sooner than later, so I appreciate kind of the, the willingness and help kind of as we've done that, because I'm sure I will have more questions as I get my my feet wet and I try to kind of understand all the issues that you all have talked about before me that I need to come up to speed on on relatively fast order. So preemptively, thank you for that. And then also thank you for, for the stuff before. The only, the only thing I've got is I attended the St. Louis Municipal League newly elected official dinner luncheon, which was, which was nice both to be able to meet some, some of the other elected officials in town, but also just get like the crash course on some of the basic stuff that you all you know just kind of know in the practice that i wouldn't have known so it's kind of nice to have gone through that and to have some of that base level so that was good and then as as we all voted on i look forward to reporting back moving forward on the on the two committees over the next couple of weeks and and whatnot so very good okay you also got sworn in 
outside of a meeting. Okay. So you oh, better tell us all that you really got. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. Oh, yeah. I mentioned it earlier. Actually. June was nice enough to accommodate a, a May Day swearing in ceremony. So um, I appreciate that as well. Otherwise, Ira, I told him he'd have to show back up tonight until I was able to be sworn in. So he was happy I got sworn in. Uh, I don't know. He stopped me on why I was driving here. I figured he was there to stop my car and then your car heading this direction. <laughs> he was out walking. Either that or he was just on his way here because it was reflective right, at that right. point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, um, I don't have a ton. So um, this morning, it's just top of mind. I attended the um, police prayer breakfast. Uh, put on by the, is it the Police Officers Association? Or, the, or Police Chiefs Association, sorry, of which our esteemed chief is the treasurer, I saw. Uh, but it was, as always, very inspiring. Um, luckily, over the past year, there have been no uh, fallen officers in our area. So that, that was good news. But a um, uh, couple of speakers that were very inspiring as well, and it's just a great event. And um, in in connection with that, I know that you all probably already know this that this is Police Week. Um, we started that on Sunday, correct? And um, today we I don't do it. I'm gonna try to do. I'm trying to alert you guys ahead of time next time. But uh, every year we've we've had the um, the privilege of hearing from Patty Bratcher. Uh, playing her bagpipes at our own station. And so I went to that at noon today and that was that is always fun. I ever people know me, they know I love bagpipe music. So um it it was it was very fun. Um she's very kind to come and do that for us because I know she's a dispatcher and works night shifts. Is that correct? So um so police week, tell your friends, appreciate our officers. Um I attended open streets and uh, it was a, a profound effort by our staff. Uh, thank you guys for that. Everybody was there with their booths and stuff. So I um, have to think about that again. Um, the Earth meeting was, was good. All the indicators are great. Um, there is um, a, a uh, Board of Education breakfast tomorrow, which I'm sure I'll see most of you at. And that was really great of them to, to uh, initiate that and host it. Uh, and um, we talked about the Wash U meetings. Um, the other thing I, I can alert you to is that uh, at our last Muni League board meeting, the county presented, they are now doing their own comprehensive plan. Um, it's kind of a mega plan. And so I'll try to alert you when there's chances for you to hear about it. Um, I'm, I know there's information on the county's website but um, it's it's going to be a big hairy deal, and we'll see how we might interrelate with that with our own. Um, and there is the Muni League installation dinner on the twenty third. Unfortunately, high school graduation night, but I will be going out as the president, and the mayor of Florissant will be coming in. Um, I will continue to attend though after that. But uh, uh, so it uh, it'll be a nice event if you can make it. Um, uh, Jody Sowell from the Missouri History Museum is going to speak. He is a fantastic speaker, very inspiring, and he'll give his spiel on uh, this is St. Louis. I don't think we know each other. It's a really great presentation. So any other comments, questions? Um, oh, I was just going to I was going to congratulate Andrea. <laughs> on her wonderful award that she got. So oh, I I'm sorry. Was was <laughs> yes. Congratulations. I didn't realize it had been announced. I wasn't saying anything. Mm -hmm. So, okay, good. Yeah, great. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for all of your, thank you very much for all of your hard work. Yeah. Well-deserved. Any others, any other comments, questions? Okay, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we're done. I'm going to ask the two young ladies that are here, what are you doing here? 